Uh, I'm Rick Wilson, the director of Ciencia, and I'd like to thank you for attending the lecture today. Uh, this year's series is entitled Panoply, and I take the meaning to be uh, a broad tapestry of talent. Uh, the aim of the series is to showcase uh, the many different streams of research uh, and ideas that are here at Rice. Ciencia members have hoped that this will encourage cross-school fertilization, and so far this semester it seems to have worked quite well. Uh, to that end, we, we have three speakers uh, who have each been instructed to take 10 or 12 minutes to talk about some topic on which they share, uh, in which they have expertise and have shared interests. So today's general topic is environmental diversity. Uh, these lectures are going to address the fact that our environment is changing in a myriad of interconnected ways. Uh, three perspectives are brought together uh, from engineering, earth sciences, and the social sciences. And these are to illuminate not only the complex changes we're seeing today, but also the diversity of their impacts on society and of technological approaches being developed here at Rice to address this most ch pressing challenge facing humanity. Our first speaker is going to be Lawrence Young, uh, an assistant professor of Earth, Environmental, and Planetary Sciences. Lawrence uh, graduated from Oberlin College in 2004 and earned his PhD uh, from Caltech in 2010. He was a postdoctoral researcher and faculty member at UCLA and came to Rice in 2015. His research focuses on Earth's atmosphere, its chemistry, and how solid Earth and life affect it. Um, his work is published in many physical and chemical journals and in 2016 was awarded the F.W. Clark Medal from the Geochemical Society. He is currently working under a fellowship from the David and Lucille Packard Foundation among many other things that he does. Our second speaker is uh, Laura Schaefer, who's the Burton J. and Anne M. McMurtry Chair in Engineering and Department Chair of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, Laura received a BS in uh, Mechanical Engineering and a BA in English here from Rice. Uh, her PhD was earned at Georgia Tech, or excuse me, yes, Georgia Institute of Technology. My, my friends that I have there call it Georgia Tech. Um, uh, until 2015, she was at the University of Pittsburgh and was lured back to Rice in 2015. Uh, Laura is a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Sustainable Energy Technologies and Assessments. Her, her work centers on the analysis, design, and optimization of energy systems with an emphasis on improving energy efficiency and diversification for increased sustainability. Our third speaker, Jim Elliott, is professor and chair of the sociology department. He received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin in uh, 1997, and he's had, held tenured positions at the University of Oregon and Tulane University. He has been at Rice since, and I don't remember the date. When did we get you here? 2014. 2014. That's right. Thank you. His work focuses on social, social inequality and urban environmental change. His uh, 2018 book, uh, entitled Sites Unseen, was uh, published by the Russell Sage Foundation and details the hidden environmental hazards in U.S. cities. Uh, I am very much looking forward to all three talks, and without ado, Lawrence. Further ado. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, today I want to talk to you about what could be conceived of as my favorite molecule. Um, it's something I've studied quite a bit. We call it ozone. Uh, you see hints of it up here, this kind of bluish layer. You can't really see it too well. Turns out it's because it absorbs in the ultraviolet, um, which we can't really see. Um, <clears throat> there are other ways to write this out. You could say O3 because there are three oxygen atoms. If you're a chemist, you write it out. Maybe this would be one half of the two ways that you would write it out with two oxygens and kind of, or three oxygens in kind of a triangle shape. Um, or if you're someone like me, you write it like this, O2 plus O, because O2 is something we breathe, it's oxygen, and then O is just something you add on later, which turns out maybe to be useful uh, when decoding it. Um, so in the theme of environmental diversity, ozone is really appropriate because yes, it does block UV light from the sun, it's bad for us, we don't like UV light, it causes mutations genetically, it causes also some really nice things uh, potentially also at the surface. When you have ozone at the surface, you can get really nice chemistry that yields things like this Great Smoky Mountains are literally our purple mountains majesty or, thank, or in part uh, thanks to this little molecule. Now there are other things that are not so good. Ozone was actually uh, discovered uh, or really sort of um, 
uh, you know, really, the, the research on ozone was really sort of, it, it was exploded by the uh, observation that there were some problems with crops. It turns out that ozone can react with the organic molecules in plants and reduce yields and such uh, in agricultural uh, areas, and that became a problem. And of course, you may have heard of the Antarctic uh, stratospheric ozone hole, and this is just an animation from NASA that depicts the size of this thing over the continent of Antarctica in 2017. And so there are ways in which ozone is good for us and that we really enjoy, and there are things in, way in which ozone is not so bad, or sorry, is, is not so great for us. Um, and so a simple adage to live by is that it's good up high and bad nearby. Of course, good up high is the ozone layer, and bad nearby is the effects of ozone pollution. This is typically what we think of when we think of when we look out at a hazy uh, Houston or uh, Los Angeles skyline. We see a lot of haze. We're seeing both particles and also uh, uh, the impacts of ozone that help create some of those particles. Okay, so in general, what we're interested in doing, what I want to talk to you about today, is the evolution of sort of this bad ozone down below. It turns out that we know we've been doing some not so great things. We have been burning a bunch of forests. We have been burning a bunch of coal. We've also been burning a bunch of other fossil fuels for our, you know, that, that improve our lives in, in, in important ways. But in doing so, um, what that means is that we're also emitting a lot of sort of uh, a lot of not so great things into the atmosphere. Some of them might be carbon monoxide, which is plot here on the left. This is merely amount. Um, nitrogen dioxides or nitrogen oxides also tend to increase, and then also uh, leakages or things like, like this for um, volatile organic carbon compounds. They also are not so great in part because they interact and can cause more air pollution. Interestingly, so if you look at this, this, these are inventories. These are basically best guesses based on what we understand about how much, uh, how much we've start done biomass burning or uh, fossil fuel burning leading to the emission of these things. But we don't actually have a really great idea of how these have evolved over time, especially since, say, 1850 when we, had, uh, when we really started ramping up industrial processes. And so we know that these things can lead to more ozone, lead to decreases in air qualities as it were. And so if you look back in the literature, it turns out, okay, well, there are a couple measurements, direct measurements of ozone uh, from, say, the late 19th century. And they sort of plot down here. This axis here is, I apologize, this is parts per billion. Uh, so one, so 10 parts of ozone per billion parts of air. Um, and then this axis is time or in years. And you can see there seems to be a clear evolution moving upwards. Um, Little do we know, uh, what's not shown here is that actually these early measurements were done kind of like in a pH meter kind of sense. You take a little strip of starch paper and you wet it, and then you sort of see, you develop it, and you match the color to some color chart. And you say, okay, this is what it is. This is what the levels are. Turns out it's nonspecific, so which means that some of these measurements are actually maybe not so great. Um, so we don't actually know what those levels were like. And when you add, you can add on to that the fact that the very, very best, absolutely the best state-of-the-art state atmospheric chemistry models cannot reproduce these levels at all. This, is, this problem has existed for decades, that the state-of-the-art models sit here. Again, this is in parts per billion. These are, this is actually months of the year. And the historical measurements all sort of sit down here. So we're about a factor of two or more off, which is kind of a, it's a, it's a huge problem, because that suggests that maybe there's something wrong with our ability to simulate the atmosphere or its chemistry. Right? So the question is, is there a real problem, or is it that these measurements are sort of iffy? Typically, how we would look at this is we would go back and try and look at ancient atmosphere. We'd try and get snapshots from the ice core record. So the ice core record is snow that falls, for example, on Greenland or Antarctica, and the oldest stuff tends to sink to the bottom, gets covered by the younger stuff, and so if you drill a core down, you can look at the older ice down here and measure the composition of the atmosphere at eight, some age here, and then it's going to be younger up here. So this is what you would ideally like to do. This is actually a cool video we shot in our lab where you melt ice in a vacuum, and you see those little bubbles. These are actually ancient air, right, from hundreds of years ago. The problem with this so they don't actually contain any ozone. This ozone's so reactive, it's not there anymore. 
We can't actually look at it. So we have to look at it indirectly. So this comes back to the idea of what this ozone molecule is. And why do I like to look at it as O2 plus O, right? So here's your ozone structure here. Well, it turns out if you look at uh, a molecule here, yes, there is, in fact, an oxygen molecule effectively locked within that. And if you can tag that, if you can take your, you know, this, this is a shark or a bird or something like that, and you stick a tag on it, yes, you can start looking at what used to be in an ozone molecule. And that's exactly what we're doing. Turns out nature has its own little tag. Today is National Isotope Day, and we use stable isotopes here, oxygen-18. This is, if you remember from freshman chemistry class, it is an atom with with a different number of neutrons from the normal type of atom, and so it differs in mass by, by a little bit. And these are natural tags for these types of uh, chemistries. And so, of course, you can now look at this molecule within the ice core record because that is preserved. And so typically, we expect when we have more ozone, this amount actually goes down. And the, the physics behind this are very broad and, um, and involved, so I won't bore you with the details, but that's the basic behavior. So what we've done is we've looked at ice cores from all around the world. So we've gone, well, also modern air from Houston, Tasmania. So northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, uh, ice cores from Greenland and Antarctica and, and et cetera. And what we've done is we've compared our measurements to predictions that we can make using state-of-the-art atmospheric chemistry models and asked the question, can we make these line up? Is there sufficient uh, ability to, to simulate chemistry of the ancient atmosphere? Well, the short answer is, okay, so we see this is the modern stuff sort of sits over here, and this is the uh, ancient stuff. So this is prior to uh, industrialization sort of sits over here. So in other words, we have more of this 1818 which means there was less ozone then. So to first order, yes, we're, our signal is doing something correct. Now let's try and simulate this a little bit more quantitatively. This is a plot of that 1818 shift, and this is years uh, in calendar years, and this star right here is the best atmospheric chemistry model we have, and this is the range of the data that we've been measured, which is really good. That means we're actually seeing an overlap between what we measure and what we're modeling. Um, there are other models that don't perform as well, and we can actually show this, and so this is the modeled change in ozone, so the two different stars here is the best model we have that goes along with the increase in emissions, um, and so this model seems to perform actually quite well. So the short answer here is I think we're actually doing pretty well uh, in modeling the chemistry of the ancient atmosphere, something that we didn't know before. What this also means is that we can start looking forward in time and maybe have a better sense of what's, what might go on in the future. So we know th this is a plot. This is for a satellite view of precursor emissions from China. This little blue dot here. So this uh, color here, red means that emissions are growing over the past decade, and then Blue means that emissions are decreasing over the past decade. It turns out in certain well-known, uh, uh, quite developed cities in China, like Shanghai and Beijing, emissions are actually decreasing thanks to pressure for uh, air quality regulations, but also there's a large swath of China where you see emissions increasing. And so our question is, well, can we, we would, uh, as a community, we'd really like to be able to predict how well, uh, to predict well what the, uh, evolution of air pollution is going to be moving on to the future as it is coupled with, uh, with economic growth. And there are also other instances where you might think it might be important where this is here is a map of the Middle East. This is Syria. This, these uh, precursor emissions are associated with civil unrest and conflict. And so there are re really good reasons to try and simulate um, the, uh, effectively the air quality uh, in, in a global sense both moving forward and moving back in time. So this is just one thing that we do in our lab. Uh, this is a group picture of all the group, uh, of lab members. And uh, we typically, this is the kind of thing we do. We look for new ways of looking at uh, environmental uh, changes in the past in the present so we can inform our future. So thanks a lot. For moving on, to uh, my talk, I'm going to be talking a little bit more, assuming the clicker works, yeah, talking a, a little bit more about how this environmental diversity 
interacts with human behavior, and in particular, how it interacts with human behavior in terms of the energy that we produce and that we consume. And so some of the, the kind of big questions that we try to answer in, in my laboratory are, you know, how do we come up with better ways to satisfy our insatiable hunger for energy without further damaging our environment, or damaging our environment as little as possible in doing so? And to do that, how do we sustainably utilize the resources that are available to us? And beyond the energy and environment, what are the interrelated consequences of our choices and of our actions? Um, if you want to look at energy on a global scale, you'll see the shape of this curve looks very similar. Sorry, the clicker seems to be dying. Looks very similar to some of those pollution slides that Lawrence showed early on in his talk. This is world energy consumption from about 1820 to about 20, 2010 or so, and it's pretty clearly steadily clicking upward, right? I mean, we had a, a nice level grade until about like the mid-1800s or so, and it's increasing, increasing, and it's not increasing in a renewable sense very much. We have a lot of natural gas, oil, coal, and biofuels that are feeding this growth for energy. And a lot of people look at this slide and they're like, yes, of course it's going to increase, but population has also increased a lot over that time period. And if we look at this on a per capita basis, you can see it's not quite as exponential in its growth, but it's also not very optimistic either, right? Even with a per capita basis, our hunger for energy is increasing and increasing. And again, a lot of things, oil and coal and natural gas, those are increasing as well. And even some of the things we might consider to be more renewable sources, such as hydroelectric power generation, there are some problems with that as well, as I'm sure you're all aware, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Now, zooming in on how these different sources are broken down, you know, right now, this is from a couple of years ago, about 20% of our uh, power, our global energy consumption, comes from so-called renewable sources. And that seems very encouraging. But if you break it down, you can see only about half of that is from modern renewables, whereas about 9% of the total uh, energy consumption, or about half of the renewables, so to speak, comes from biomass. And again, if you think back to the slides that Lawrence was showing, there are obviously a lot of negative consequences from burning this biomass. It might be renewable, but it has an impact in our environment. I mean, in fact, if you think about it, even things like coal and natural gas are sort of biomass in their own way, just compacted over thousands and thousands of years, right, from when the dinosaurs were tromping around in swamps and things like that. Moreover, if we want to look at our modern renewables, you can see even those, about half of those come from more modern biomass, less environmentally impactful biomass, but still biomass all the same. And another about half of it or so comes from hydropower, whereas hydropower, again, is very problematic. And moreover, if we move from energy consumption altogether to look at electricity consumption, electricity consumption, the picture is a little even more bleak with about, again, a quarter of uh, our electricity, worldwide electricity com consumption coming from renewable electricity. And about 16 of the 23%, about two-thirds of that comes from hydroelectric resources, right? So obviously, that's a big interaction between our energy production, our energy consumption, and the environment. So what we want to do is we want to move beyond some of these more traditional ways of generating renewable energy, uh, so-called renewable energy, electricity, et cetera, and try to take advantage of the environmental diversity around us to match our power generation with the resources we have on hand without imposing our will on the environment. I mean, in terms of the, the general list of renewable energy technologies, the top three of these you could probably name off the top of your head. Everyone can come up with solar, wind, and water. Look at those in a little bit more detail. But there are other means as well, energy harvesting, uh, combined heat and power, cascading energy systems. Basically, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get as much out of our resources as possible without uh, throwing anything away that would otherwise be useful. Now, how do we decide between things like solar, wind, and water? Well, conveniently, we don't have to decide between them on an overall national point of view. We can utilize all three of these. We need to grow in all of these areas. And this, going from a worldwide perspective to a national perspective, if you want to look at where our resources are, you know, your solar map looks pretty much like you would expect it to, right? I mean, you got the darker the color, the better it is for solar power generation, whether it's photovoltaics or solar thermal. You know, where it's in the south, where there are deserts, where it's hot, that's where you can take the most advantage of PV. You look up north, though, and you're like, oh, gosh, you know, through the Midwest, through the Northeast, I just, it doesn't seem like PV is as good of an option. 
and it's not. But conveniently, if you want to look at where our greatest wind resource potential is, that big gap that we had right in the middle of the country there, that's where it's strongest for wind resource generation. Moreover, if you want to look along the coastal areas where a lot of our cities are located, that offshore area, that's fantastic for wind uh, power generation. There's still some areas that are missing though, right? We still have this whole like sort of northeast and midwest corridor that seems to have a bit of a gap between the solar and the wind. Well, fortunately, that's where we have a whole lot of rivers and things like that, and we can take advantage of our hydropower generation. So the idea is to look at what is available locally and build your power infrastructure around that. Now, just briefly going over some of these renewable technologies, I think a lot of people have heard of photovoltaics, right? You can see solar cells there, very prominent in the news. There are things like the Tesla solar shingles that everyone is talking about. And PV electric generation is a terrific technology, and we're making huge inroads in the efficiency for PV generation. But the materials that these photovoltaic cells are made out of also have consequences on the environment, right? So some of the most efficient solar cells that are out there right now are made up of multiple sheets of uh, germanium and gallium, gallium arsenide and gallium indium phosphide. It's not like you're walking down the street and you're like, oh, I've got some gallium arsenide here. I'll just make some solar cells out of it or anything like that, right? There's extraction, there's transportation, there's production, and all of these have long-term environmental consequences. So PV is terrific and you know, we do a lot of work on it in my group, but there are other ways of generating power as well, and that's through th solar thermal. How many people in here actually know how a standard power plant works? Does anyone know how a power plant works? Okay, a couple of people, let's go to a standard power plant, whether it's fueled by you know, natural gas or coal. I see the two mechanical engineers in the back, they're like, yeah, we know how that works. Uh, basically, you take that, you burn it, you make things really hot, you take water, you turn it into steam, and from that steam, you can extract energy. Ooh, something just happened over there, okay, it's back. We can do the same thing with the sun. We can use arrays of mirrors to concentrate sunlight onto this power tower in the middle, and instead of burning something, we're using solar energy to provide that same sort of phase change of the fluid to provide heat. And using that, you have a lot less exotic materials that you're using to produce your electricity. Moreover, you can also produce thermal energy that has other applications as well. For wind technologies, this slide is super boring. A lot of different people have tried different things to improve wind technologies over the years. Building integration for wind was really hot for a while, and it does have a role, but the payback period for wind integration in buildings is really high. These wind turbines that you see you know, towering over the plane, these are the most efficient technologies. They have a pretty great payback period. They're the really good way to go for wind power generation. For water technologies, though, that's where things kind of fall apart, right? Because what have we done for years and years and years? We've used dams. And dams are very efficient in terms of producing electricity, but they also have horrific environmental consequences to the flora, to the fauna, and also societal consequences as well. You saw that map of China. Lauren, we didn't coordinate our slides in advance, but Lawrence's slides are all like perfect for this presentation the map of China that showed all the pollution that was coming out from a lot of power generation, transportation, things like that. Well, the Three Gorges Dam is a terrific solution to that. It provides 10 times the power of the Hoover Dam. The downside, though, is it also wrecked an ecosystem and displaced hundreds of thousands of people, which is perhaps a slightly negative consequence of building the dam. One way that we're addressing this, and this is why rivers are so important, though, is to focus on things that we can embed in our waterways, that we can embed in our tidal estuaries, in our rivers, not displace people, not change the ecosystem. In fact, a lot of these hydrokinetic turbines, uh, things like this puppy right here and these up here in the upper corner, you can actually embed them on the beds of streams. And there have been long-term studies that have been conducted on these that it doesn't even affect local fish populations in those areas. So, you know, you have a little bit of, uh, chum that comes up sometimes, but there are protective measures that people have learned to put in place with these turbines as well. I'm running like a little low on time right here, so I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit. I wanted to talk a little bit about how food and energy and water are all tied together for some of these larger consequences. I'll skip through that. The one thing I want to emphasize here is when we think about the impact that our power generation has on the environment, 
It's not just in the pollutions that go up into the air. It's not just in the smog that sits on the ground. It's also in the way that we are destroying our access to palatable, potable, accessible water. A standard family of four might use 400 gallons of water per day for showering, drinking, cooking, etc. They then use three times that to provide the cooling and the power plants for the electricity they consume on a daily basis if they are producing energy through a, a standard power plant. So there are these unexpected consequences as well. Now, all of this is very negative. Things are bad, things are bad, things are bad. <laughs> If you want to look at an integrated view, it's complicated to solve this problem. Food, energy, water, they're all tied together in so many different ways. But I don't view this as something that is purely negative. I view this as a challenge that it is time for us to motivate ourselves to face. We are running out of time. This was from three years ago. You can see what the monsoons that are sweeping through Asia, with the wildfires that are sweeping through California, we are running out of time to do this, but we are not running out of will, and we are not running out of the sort of cohesion, societal cohesion that we need to do this. And right here on this campus, right, we had JFK come and give the moonshot talk. And he said, now is the time to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. That was true for putting a man on the moon. It's true for addressing these energy and environmental challenges right now. So. Thank you very much. I'll pass it on to Jim. Wonderful. So on the theme of challenges, uh, as sociologists, we are concerned about the social challenges, as all, all, all of us, I think, in this room. So I want to touch on that, the environmental diversity of the social impacts of disasters and recoveries in the US, and probably show you something you've seen before and might know, but to kick things off, um, Climate change is not something on the horizon. It's happening now in terms of the overall impacts and the frequency of these high sort of intensity events related to climate. So that's the red bars here. We can think of those as weather related events. And if you look through time to the best that we can observe them, we have the, the blue line being sort of the, the social impacts measured simply in property damages in billions. So this is global. If you come out more recent, this line actually goes up quite dramatically. And in the US, if you begin to do approximations and projections that people have done, in the next 30 year, the expectation is that uh, property damages from natural hazards like tornadoes, floods, hurricanes, et cetera, are going to at minimum double um, if mitigation strategies that are planned actually work. And they're going to quadruple if they don't really work. And neither one of those scenarios is counting in climate change aspects. So we're pretty sure it's going to be even more than the quadruple. So the question for us as social scientists is, what is that going to do? And just getting on the theme of Laura's, it's great that we have this diversity of environmental impacts or um, opportunities for renewables. But what it comes with is not just a resource, but a hazard. So if you look across the country, some people will say, oh, well, you know, hazards, tornadoes, that's really just in certain areas. But if you look across the US, You've got floods on one side. That's the last 10 years or so. The, the brighter colors are, are more intense floods, more damage, tornadoes and hurricanes and wildfires. Point here being is not only that climate change is upon us and it's already happening and it's manifesting in terms of these more costly disasters and impacts on property and communities, it's happening everywhere. It's not a Texas problem. It's not a California problem. It's an American problem. It's just a matter of what form that takes in terms of the environmental uh, impact. So the question that um, I had with a, a student was basically how do disaster damages and recoveries affect Americans' well-being over the long term? This seemed a very basic question. We went out sort of looking for answers. There aren't any. And there are sorts of reasons for that. One reason is the investment intellectually into that question has been disaster-centric. People will go and do a case study of Katrina or of Harvey or of some historic event, the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. And so you get snapshots and mechanisms in place, but you don't really know what's happening over time. And so what we wanted to do is flip that perspective around. And so one of the studies that we did, this is Junia Howe, who I'm proud of. She is the first PhD in sociology that Rice has ever produced. 
Uh, so we worked together on a number of papers. This is one of them. She's now an assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh. Yeah, go. What is it? Um, no, what's Panthers. Panthers. Yeah, go Panthers. So we wanted to look at various things. We're going to focus on wealth here. And I wanted to go a little bit into the weeds on this. This is a paper that's picked up um, some popular uh, attention and has also been the subject of something I'll mention later with Congress. But basically, we were trying to get into the statistics. And my dad's a physicist, and he's known me my entire life, including my life as a sociologist. He still doesn't know what I do. When I go over and talk to my colleagues over in Mech Lab and, you know, City, you know, they still don't know what sociologists do. So I'm going to go a little bit into that. Sociologists do everything. We do field studies. We do historical analysis. We also do statistical analyses. So this is a statistical analysis. And what we're trying to do, again, is turn the usual perspective of an event case sort of research design into a more longitudinal, generalizable statistical model. And so what we're going to do is it would be very expensive to go out both in times and money to follow people individually over time. And so what we're going to do is we're going to rely on a study that the federal government has been funding in the social sciences called the Panel Survey of Income Dynamics, which asks a lot of questions, not just on economics or income, but actually follows people through time. So it's been doing it before 1999, but we're going to pick it up there because that's a better sample in terms of the representatives across the country. So we're going to follow people through this survey for about 14 or 15 years. And they get asked questions that I'll show you in a minute um, every couple of years. To that, what we're going to do, which people hadn't done before, is that we're going to go and get these compiled data on direct property damages to um, local areas by county. This comes from a database known as Sheldis or Shieldis. And we can get that data back in time for each county. And then we're also going to append FEMA information, how much money comes into an area after a disaster to help recover over the long term. So we're not going to focus on the individual assistance right at the beginning, how do you get people into housing, but what happens over the long term, five, six years after. So that's the framework. And so what this means is that we have information that we can follow for a lot of people. So we don't have randomized control studies a lot in the social sciences, there's some, but in sociology what we tend to do is try to get a lot of information so we can sort of create these quasi-experimental models by controlling for observed characteristics. So we've got information on individual level factors in the model. We've got about 3,400 random sample folks across the U.S. We know their race, education, immigrant status. Um, then we know their family factors over time, if they're getting married or cohabiting, if they're getting divorced, number of children in the household at each period. At the family level, we also know the reported wealth minus the debt that they tell us about. That's what we're going to be focusing on. We know if they're renting or owning, if they've moved in the last period. All these things are dynamic through this period. Then we can put them in the same neighborhood. We have restricted data, so we can control for the overall quality and sort of make compare apples to apples. People compare it in the same type of neighborhood. And then the factors we really care about are these local county level factors, which is the amount of natural hazard damage to property through time in an area and the amount of FEMA assistance, controlling for population and sort of the general urban rural status of the area. So that's the statistical part. And what happens with these data is that we begin first with their main independent variable. So this is the amount of property damage from natural hazards just to property. This is not lost income because you had to close your business or something else happened. It's to property. So this gets back to the original point. This is an American problem that find me a county up there that is not colored in some shade of pinkish. They're about, what, one? two, three, four, five, maybe. Turns out there's no property in those counties. Anywhere there's property, there's damage. And it's happening all the time. And it's happening repeatedly. It can be fires out here. It can be floods. It can be mudslides. It can be storms. It can be tornadoes. It's happening everywhere. And you can have good variation. So you can imagine the case study research design for a sociologist. If you were going to go out and try to do a case study of each one of these events in every place, you couldn't do it. So that bug, in a sense, becomes a feature. Now we have a lot of variation. We've got people in a lot of different places. When they move from one place to another, we move the local sort of information about damages and female assistance with them in real time through this. 
And so then in that process, we run a bunch of statistical models. Um, I'm not going to bore you with this. I'm just going to say there's some up there. And what I'm going to do is try to give you an example of controlling for all those factors and trying to compare apples and apples. What we wanted to do is create a simulation. So in this simulation, we've got two people, two ideal types. This actually corresponds to me and my neighbor in New Orleans. When I was at Tulane and getting tenure there and went through Katrina, I was actually in the city during the event, working in a hospital, et cetera. But my neighbor across the street, Crip, he was a um, high school dropout. He had been in prison, um, African-American, and I was the white, educated homeowner across the street. It was a mixed income, mixed race neighborhood. So we are in there, and in this utopian statistical world, what we're going to do is control for everything. We're going to make ourselves completely equal in terms of the amount of insurance payments we make, the amount of wealth we start at, at the beginning of this period, and the only thing that's going to change at this initial point is the amount of wealth we'd expect to accrue over the 14 or 15 year period. So over that, because I'd be white and homeowner and sort of more privileged, I would expect to get on average $60,000 more in my wealth than my neighbor across the street. That's at zero hazard damage. So now you know that really is utopian. That rarely happens. So what happens as we simulate this and we have more damage happen over this period of time? As you might imagine, bad news for Crip. He has to dip into savings. He loses security deposits. There are a lot of different mechanisms where, on average, he becomes less well off. So not only is he expected to sort of suffer the sort of the immediate consequences, but the long-term 14, 15-year consequences are reducing the resources available. Sort of expected that based on what we knew. So now what happens to someone like me? Actually, the inverse. As money begins to pour in through private insurance claims and through government recovery programs, it's not to say that people like me weren't traumatized or people here during Harvey weren't traumatized who were more educated and more privileged. It's to say that when that money flows in, even if you don't recognize that the average trend is that people who are more privileged are actually going to do better, that is creating an extra vulnerability. Not only do we have rising disaster costs over time, we have a fraying social fabric. The more that inequality goes that way, the more vulnerable we are as a society, I would say, not just crip across the street. Okay, so we were then curious, what happens when FEMA money comes in? Does it help suppress this polarization? Does it help sort of make things more right, more equal, more just? After all, it's coming from taxpayer dollars. Everybody's paying taxes more or less. It's not just property taxes. So when we look over this period, what we find is that every respondent, and we have respondents in almost every county observed in the US over this period, over 3,000 counties, and every respondent lived in a county that received at least some amount of FEMA assistance during this time period. So by the end of the period, the average is about 263 million. You can imagine there's a lot of variation. So what we did is we ran a lot of models, and what we did is we kept the amount of hazard damage constant. So we exposed statistically everyone to the same hazard damage. And we just said, what happens when more or less FEMA money comes in? So what happens is that there's further, further polarization. That on top of the damage polarizing the wealth, there's also government money exacerbating that issue. So what's next? Laura talked about the challenges. Uh, Lawrence talked about the future and what we can think about in terms of these things. On the social side, there are a number of different things we can think about, but the ones that are actually happening now seem to be at least threefold. There are the legal aspects, the legislative aspects, and the scientific aspects. So briefly, the legal aspects. People at the Lone Star Legal Aid uh, group here um, got together with another legal firm. They read some of our research, so we became part of a, a suit that was filed in federal court in Corpus Christi. Um, so it alleges that basically there's inequities in how the Harvey money is going to be redistributed because it redistributes, it's prospectively redistributing three quarters of the recovery funds to homeowners rather than renters, and that that's going to be problematic not just for individuals who happen to be one of those renters, but also communities that tend to be predominantly rental. And we know that that tends to be more 
communities of color. And so that's an issue. So there are things in the courts that are beginning to make their way through based on some of this research. In April, um, Elizabeth Warren, who's on the Homeland Security Committee in the Senate, and Benny Thompson in the House, they got involved in some of this analysis, read our report, and filed an inquiry to try to get the uh, government accountability officer, the GAO, to look into long-term inequities in FEMA response and recovery. So we got a few phone calls, and basically there's an admission that no one's ever really looked at this before. And so we need to look at this. So in May, it was approved, and just last week or two weeks ago, I was out in D.C. for the first of a conversation on how you begin to even study this beyond this initial way. So that's another way, thinking about how, for those of you who don't know, GAO is the, supposedly the research arm or branch of Congress, right? I know what you're saying. They have a research branch? Um, the last part is the scientific or the empirical. In addition to the GAO, there is um, a mandate now with FEMA to do a better job in dealing with data availability. Because when we talked to FEMA about this, they pushed back and said, your numbers aren't good enough. They said, we got all the data we could. If you don't think the data are good, give us better data. And they say, we can't do that. We're not really equipped to do that. And we need to think about that. And it's like, yes, we do. And so that's another thing, getting better information. So we're not going to be boiling ice or raising it to temperature, but it's the same challenge. How do you get information out of a resistant sort of substance? Um, thank you. So we have time for some questions. Uh, any questions? So, Lawrence, uh, half my life or more was Los Angeles, the other half Houston, okay? So I grew up, you know, smog, okay? So what I want to know is, is one city more understanding, do they understand the issues more, and more progressive in attacking them and doing things? I mean, you know, UCLA, Caltech, you know, there's a lot of power there. Is Houston ahead, behind, behind, are these two cities the same? That's what I want to know. I, I want to cheer for one city, okay? Ooh, that's pretty tough. Um, so I will I will preface this by saying probably the expert, um, the best expert on this is is also on this campus, Dan Cohen, who who does a lot more with uh, Houston in particular in Texas. Yeah, but you have to give me your opinion because he's not here. Yeah, I, mean, I know, yeah. I know. I just want to I, I want to defer to expertise where it's uh, necessary. But from my perspective, uh, the state of California has had quite uh, it has made probably the the largest leaps in terms of air quality. Um, and it's related to the, you know, how well you you remove impurities from uh, fossil fuels, and also times of day, and that 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 kind of thing, and really modulating how well you can um, uh, control the emissions of precursors. Um, they've, you know, there's something known as the urban weekend effect. It turns out that trucks don't drive on weekends, as we know, and you have enough. Um, if you have enough NOx released uh, from trucks, you can actually reduce the amount of of ozone in urban areas, and so there are ways to counteract that. Um, and in Houston, I think we have a, a, a different set of problems. Uh, LA is a basin, as you know, um, and so there's a lot of pollutants that collect there, and so there's uh, a different set of challenges with how the air flows on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, whereas Houston, we typically don't have as much particle pollution, but we often have a lot of um, ozone pollution, often from power plants and, and things like that. So. Uh, as far as air quality is concerned, absolutely. Absolutely. It is done. Yeah. I just want to say here in Houston, I'm actually on a project with Dan Cohan right now where the city of Houston is looking at retrofitting its fleet to more energy efficient vehicles, electric vehicles, things like that. So that's funded by the city through the Kinder Institute, right? So they're doing something. Well, in general, right, things always move. Things are happening. They're just never happening as fast as we want them to, right, so. Yeah. Other questions? While I'm taking this up there, let me ask a quick question, which is Jim put his finger on it that this is largely a people problem. It's a human problem. Uh, so the question is, what do the rest of you think concerning that point? I think it is a people problem in a lot of ways. I mean, we have technological solutions, but if there's not the will to fund those solutions, to put those solutions in place, to believe in science even, 
among the people, then we're not going to see that type of effective change. I mean, it's interesting. You compare what's going on in this country to some other countries where there is that political will. It's, it's a very, it's a very different outlook. Yeah, it's education as well. And I mean, okay, so we could get into a whole side digression about the systemic problems with public education in this country and the way that that's changed over the past, you know, 30 years or so as well. But I'm going to give this to Lawrence and talk about, like, isotopes. <laughs> so. um, I think my, my opinion on this is it, it is a people problem, but that does not take us away from having to understand what's going on, what is, what is the current state and how it's evolving, and what are the mechanisms through which uh, the environment responds to human activity and also how humans respond to environmental adversity, for example. And so there's, uh, there, there's always two sides of this coin. Humans will, anything we do will by definition change the boundary conditions under which we're operating. So we have to really think about it from both sides. I'll just kind of take the opportunity to hop in since it was teed up. Um, I love the fact that we can agree that it's about people um, and we can hope for the future. I think sociologists and other social scientists will point out that uh, we need to go further and think about it's not just a we. we. We are all morally sort of on equal playing field, but that's not true socially. So when we talk about a we, we actually have a diversity of we. So it's not just environmental diversity, but it's social diversity and that diversity isn't just the wrong sort of lateral or horizontal things about our tastes or our cultural amenities, but it's the resources we have before us. So if you look at the New York Times and ask, how will we do or uh, with climate change? And they say, if someone comes to you, and people do, like, will climate change affect me? And the answer is, well, how rich are you and your descendants? And that's going to be a big determinant of how well you do with climate change, because as the research shows, unintendedly, some people, you might have the trauma of climate change or these disasters, and I don't want to downplay that, but if things work out and you can build and rebuild a new house and maybe you add on a little bit and you over-insured and those people who are around you are able to do the same thing, then you know maybe the sense of urgency about us doing something isn't quite as strong as if we were all experiencing the negative consequences. And also going back to education again, I mean, looking at the example of Katrina and some things that have happened in Harvey, you know, if you were able to, to pack up and move and send your kids to a private school somewhere else, their education wasn't disrupted. If you weren't, there were schools that were closed for over a year and kids were bused hours away to go to school. I mean, that that's a serious disruption in their future opportunities as part of that as well. And I'll just add one more thing. Not only did the kids... Um, you know, have to go to other schools. The entire school district teaching population was fired. Yep. They were unionized, they had pensions, they were fired, and it restarted under a new contract. And basically they said, in times of emergency, we can take drastic measures. So those people, the consequences was not just for them losing a job, but for their kids and over the long term, right? So. What's that? For, for the weather or for the policy? The policy, well, it's all the way up and down the board. So there are ways, you asked about LA um, versus Houston. You know, for instance, with the fires going on now, or just recently in California, um, had the opportunity to do some radio shows there and talk to folks. There, the state has come in and said, we're not gonna allow you to jack up rents uh, more than 10% when you have a housing supply that's hurt. So that's not going to deplete the rental population of their housing, um, you know, revenue or, and their efforts to have eviction stop. So after Katrina, or sorry, Harvey, there were the usual 4,500 evictions happen in Harris County every month. And after um, Harvey, that continued. So now you have a depleted housing stock. You have people going around and trying to solve this problem. So I, it's at all layers. We need the federal, we need the state, and we need the local. Thanks. We have a question up here. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for your presentations. Uh, I appreciated the allusions with different weights that, that uh, the speakers made to beginning to look at essentially full cycle economics and how we're going to have to um, uh, have that perspective. Uh, so that's um, 
you, you can't repeat that too much. Uh, question for Lawrence. So is, uh, is the overall oxygen budget, uh, both atmospheric and maybe soil or upper crust, uh, is it pretty much fixed? And atmospherically, you can go back and forth between um, the abundances of, of O2 and, and uh, ozone? Thanks. So, yeah, so the, you're asking about the amount of oxygen in the total, say, surface system. Usually that, um, that is governed on very, quite long time scales, on million year type time scales by the amount of uh, essentially carbon that gets removed from the surface rather than uh, anything else. When we think about isotopes, how often does a molecule of oxygen disappear? Uh, it turns out the average lifetime of an oxygen molecule uh, is about a thousand years or so. And so that will cycle back and forth between being consumed by respiration and being produced by photosynthesis. It'll take about a thousand years to do the equivalent of the entire atmosphere's worth. Well, I would like to thank our three speakers for a wonderful set of lectures that are all integrated and really interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.